The mutants called Damar the Pretender, Wayun the Dark Knight, Dukat the Dethroned King, and Zial the Princess. Wayun uses the passive voice transitive, of course. Captain Sisko says that even if he knew with 100% certainty what was going to happen, he would not ask an entire generation of people to voluntarily give up their freedom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to <laughs> The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Good job. Hello, hello. <laughs> My name is Ryan T. Huss. Today, we're doing a review of Deep Space Nine, Season 6, Episode 9, Statistical Probabilities, story by Pam Pietroforte, and written by Rene Echevarria, directed by Anson Williams, and this was November 26th, 1997. Where were you? How are you doing today, Sirach? Doing very good. Doing very well. Yeah. The reason we laughed at the beginning there was because that was my second take. That was like a just a giant <laughs> mouthful of words. And in the middle of it, I was like, man, this... This is going to take forever. So the second time, I think I just kind of sped it up and got through it. You got through it. You did good. Yeah. You did good. Oh, like thanks. Very nice. Right. So, yeah. So, uh, boy, this is going to be a fun one to talk about. Me thinks uh, this is uh, this is one I do remember from back in the day. I, I usually remember the last few seasons. <clears throat> pretty clearly. And I remember this one because this one's kind of a break from the norm. And it feels like it's one of these bottle episodes that don't really affect future episodes, right? It does. But it definitely Initially. does. Yeah, but then it definitely <laughs> raises the stakes and is very much interwoven into the, the overarching story of Deep Space Nine. Which I thought was very clever, um, their yes. approach to weaving in the main overarching story into this singular episode. It's very good weave, very good tie-in. Um, you know, when it started out, I was like, what, who are these people? Like, what is this episode? <laughs> who are these guys? Am I, is this a different uh, alternative universe or something? Um, mm -hmm. So it was funny because I think very rarely, if, if not ever in the show, have we seen the, the show start off with completely yeah. non-regular characters, right? Good point. All new, all new characters in, in right in the beginning. I don't remember seeing that without at least one, uh, you know, major star in the opening, opening scene. Right. Of course, uh, Bashir came in at the end, but right in the beginning, I was like, who are these people? Somebody explain what's going on. What did I miss? <laughs> what did Am I, I miss? on the wrong episode? Is this to be continued? Is this the second half? Yeah, a little bit of that was going on. Um, but I did like the episode. I, I thought, um, this guy who played Jack, the kind of neurotic actor in the beginning, in the opening scene. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> that guy, yeah. That guy. Yeah. yeah. If he did that in the, I, I was watching him do his performance in the, in the opening scene. And I was thinking, I know he did that during the audition. Yeah. I was thinking the same. And, and, you know, you know, as, as an actor, you know how it is when you go into the audition room. And if you have that one little thing that separates you from everybody else, that that, for example, this neurotic tick that he had, the, <laughs> I thought it added so much to the the delivery, to the performance. It, it just made him it just made him feel like he was written, which is this really kind of genius kind of character who's also mm -hmm. kind of off. So I love that uh, that sound effect or whatever it is that he kind of added to the the character. Yeah, yeah, and I wonder if you know because clearly in the description, you know, they they kind of explain what what he is when he's auditioning, and I wonder if he thought I need to give myself a tick, something whether it's a scratch, whether it's a this and the, and yeah, like you're saying the the people that are casting they always say the same thing somebody that gives us something different or somebody that gives us something memorable and so many times when you get a role and you say you know if you get the the, the chance to say well what you know why did i get it or how did, what did i do in the audition they say something to the effect of well you're the one that gave us something different you know you <laughs> and then yeah. it makes you think god that must be painful to sit through 20 people doing the same thing but it's true. It's like when, when you see 20 people doing the same thing and one person does something different, you go, huh, even if it's not necessarily the right thing, 
it still makes them stand out. And then you're like, well, I can work with this. I can coach them into what I'm envisioning. At least these people, this person can do something different, you know? Yeah. And I have a couple of stories in that department. One is a friend of mine went on an audition and uh, he said that at a certain point during the scene, he, he basically jumped on top of the casting director's desk and cleared off whatever was on the desk, threw it on the floor and grabbed them by the collar. It, <laughs> it, it was a bold move, It is, know, but it was part, it's part of the scene, but uh, that, that worked and got the person the job because it was just like so intense, you know, they're the, <laughs> grabbing the casting director's collar in their face and adding to the intensity of the moment. So those kinds of things, those kind of decisions as an actor can work for you. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another example. Um, after we did, well, kind of overlapping, but uh, during the final year of Deep Space Nine, I went out for an audition for the Showtime show, The Hoop Life, which I eventually yeah. booked and, and was uh, starring in. But when I went out for that audition, I remember specifically bringing my basketball. Very good. So I had a, I, I, I keep a basketball in my car, you know, and as I was going up to the audition, I just said, hey, you know what? Let me bring my basketball with this basketball yeah. show. Right. So I come into the audition room dribbling a basketball and I was the only person in the waiting room with a basketball. And everybody else is thinking, shit, I should have done that. <laughs> yeah. Right. It seems so yeah. obvious once you see right. it. Right. It seemed obvious once you see it. And yeah. so it just it was the perfect prop. It was the perfect. It just made it, you know, just all blended together. I'm dribbling the ball. They can see my ball handling skills yep. in the office. You can well. demonstrate that you can play. Plus, a lot of times, if yeah. you have something in your hands, it gives you something to focus on. It gives you something to, to focus your energy yeah. on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was and brilliant. Also, yeah, it was it was a brilliant move. I, I booked the job. It was great. And I said, wow, that basketball was the move. That was the move. I hope you still have your and lucky basketball. <laughs> I still have it. Nice. Um, and, you know, and so those are the kinds of uh just decisions that are choices that you make as an actor be before you go into the room. You know, it could be uh, what you wear. Um, it could be, you know, it could be making the choice to like, you know, put on a, um, a police officer's outfit if you're going out for something sure. like that. Um, just that little extra bit could make the difference between you getting the job and not because, you know, you walk in there and you're already looking for part, you know, they're like, oh, well, he's, mm -hmm. you know, he's ready to go. So, I thought about this particular actor. His name is Tim Ransom and he played this Jack character and I thought he, he did a fantastic job. So I just Definitely. wanted to make sure we gave him his credit. Yeah. That's cool. You know, uh, I want to throw out a couple more examples too. And I know some people are at home are like, but what about if we're not actors or directors or producers? How does this help? <laughs> well, use this in life. If you are trying to get a significant other and you're in a big group of people, what do they say? You need to stand out in a crowd. You need to say something different or be noticed, you know? Some people call it pickup lines. Some people call it, you know, be yourself. I mean, whatever it is, you just, you know, use this in life. But uh, when I was, when I was holding auditions for a production, I remember the person that we cast for one of those productions, um, he actually, and this actually kind of annoyed me, but it did give him a, it did make him stand out and it gave him a better, uh, performance he used he was supposed to be it was supposed to be a romantic comedy and he was supposed to be like asking out a girl or whatever right and uh it was like he hands the girl flowers and does whatever he turned the sides the sides are like the script the you know whatever the lines he turned those into like a bouquet like he just he rolled up the paper and, and held them like the bouquet and he used this as like a prop and this and that and it worked for the performance but i was annoyed because i'm like hey dude we didn't print out a lot of these sides, man. Now that one's ruined and other people. Are <laughs> so sometimes you're actually screwing over the other people that are auditioning, yeah. but it's a dog eat dog world, right? Another one was uh, there was a lady that was auditioning to be an alien. And just like what we said, she was the only one that did something different. Everybody else was trying to be like, like this magnanimous alien and whatever like that. And she took it in a comedic direction. She just acted like a weirdo, you know, and that's, and they're like, okay, cool. Uh, one that I did was when I was auditioning, 
And there was this one line where he's supposed to play like, it's going to be a tough one to believe that I could audition for this, but it was supposed to be like the douchey guy at the, at the office, you know, like the guy, says, I know, I know. know, like, you know, the guy that's like, <laughs> that's like in the office building. That's just like, Oh, that's Henry or whatever. And there was just one line where somebody says like, Oh, do you want some donuts? And the line was sprinkles. Cool. Right. And I, yeah harnessed my inner Kramer and was like, Oh, sprinkles. Cool. You know, and tried to make it like, boy, Oh boy, what are they, you know, I don't remember exactly yeah. what I did, but they're like, that's what they said. They said, you got the role because you gave us something different. Everybody else read that line straight. They gave nothing oh. to it. And they're like, we tried to write a comedic line and nobody read it as comedy. You read it as comedy. There you go. Anyway. This guy clearly did that. And now he's going to come on the show one day and be like, no, no, that was a director decision. <laughs> <laughs> and well, that's a good, that's a good segue to the director, uh, which is actually another person that I wanted to talk a little bit about. Yeah. Uh, Anson Williams. Very nice. And Anson Williams, I, I saw his name and I said, where have I seen this guy? And I, I never worked with him. Obviously I'm not in this episode, but I never worked with him, but I looked him up and, Turns out he played on Happy Days and he was Potsy on Happy Days yeah. for 10 years or so. So uh, nice little segue there. Maybe he did give some direction to the actor and said, hey, I, you know, add this little tick to it. But it seemed too ingrained in his performance that I think it's something that he brought to the table when he auditioned for this role. And um, <clears throat> it certainly made it work. He also, uh, I remember seeing him a few times. And I don't remember if it was only in Star Trek, obviously happy days is what he's known for, but he also directed it's only a paper moon. So we are going to see the second deep space nine episode that he directed. Oh, wow. Uh, soon yeah. in Aaron's favorite episode. That was his director. That was, uh, that was his guy. And he also oh, wow. directed four episodes of Voyager, but I think, I think that's where I heard about it was from Aaron talking about it's only a paper moon because I do remember talking about him as a director and I don't remember how that situation came up. But that's pretty cool. Mm. Pretty interesting. Yeah. It's a little interesting uh, tidbit there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this episode really, you know, I, I enjoyed it because um, it, it covered so many topics that I feel like well, specifically the whole genetically engineered Bashir. I was like, okay, this is a Bashir episode. That was the yes. first thing I wrote down. A plot Bashir, right? So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get Please into that. Please let there be so a B plot. <laughs> yeah. And then I was thinking, I hope there's a B plot. I hope there's a B plot. And very cleverly, they brought in the Damar uh, way in B plot, which I thought was just very well done. Yes. And then, of course, when you see Jeffrey Combs' name in the credits, you're like, okay. I'm going to get something great here. This get is, your popcorn ready. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, get your popcorn ready. So I had my popcorn ready. I was expecting it. Um, of course, Casey Biggs as well. When you see these guys, you're like, okay, this is going to be good. You know, they have certain gravitas to their performance. So mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed the whole, the whole flow of it. Yeah, you know, um, and I thought that's what saved this episode. Because I remember sometimes this happens in Star Trek where I start to watch an episode and when it first starts, I kind of like, I remember back in the day, you know, Oh, Oh, it's a Bajoran politics episode. And me going like, Oh man, you know, I want to see the <laughs> dominions and battles and all that. Yet by the end of the episode, I found myself entertained and invested in the episode because they figured out a way to make it important to us, whether it's, you know, Kira's, you know, emotional journey or whether it has political implications or, or they raise the stakes. In this case, they did that too, because I remember when I first saw it way back in the day going like, what is this? this is, I don't care about these guys. This is, they're kind of annoying and weird. And, and I, that's not why I watch this show. And again, when I, when it came on, I was like, oh yeah, you know, I remember these guys, you know, it's, it's kind of 50, 50 for me. Right. But they found a way they raised the stakes. Now it's about, holy shit, 900 billion people are going to die. We're going to lose to the dominion. 
these guys are are faced with the dilemma of, hey, if we just go betray the Federation, then only 2 billion people will die and the Federation will lose immediately and it'll save a ton of lives. And all these things like make sense and we get it. And it does have important implications. The stakes are raised. We get Damar and Wei Yun coming. Suddenly, it's a good episode, right? Suddenly, it, it, all, it, it all works. It's all interesting and, and we're emotionally invested in it. Absolutely. And <clears throat> the other thing I thought was interesting was just a little bit of the background about, you know, the, um, I was trying to put myself in the time period. This was in 97, 98. Yeah, 97. 97. And I'm, I'm thinking in 97, what were we discussing in society? And one of the topics that kind of goes into my head is um, it was around uh, and or about that time when um, cloning sheep was a big deal. Do you remember when that was yeah. a topic and they were talking about whether we should or should not clone animals like sheep or whatnot Interesting. Um, and playing with genetics and that's in that sense. And it became a big issue of morality about whether people should alter genetics and try to, you know, quote, quote unquote, play God, or if we should just, you know, leave things natural as they are. And I believe that that was one of the impetus for writing this episode. I think that's the conversation around genetic manipulation was really heavy at that time. Uh, a lot less so now. Uh, it's kind of, you know, um, more accepted because, you know, we've, we've mapped the human genome and we've kind of, yeah. you know, have all of these advanced ways to use genetics to uh, improve people's lives. But at this time, it was, it was a real debate about, about whether right. it was about whether it was the right thing or wrong thing to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember my uh, physiology teacher was, you know, and this is all nineties kind of stuff. You know, they, he said like, uh, we're going to be mapping the human genome. We're going to be doing all this stuff. But, you know, he was saying it's going to take X amount of years. And anytime when you're a kid and somebody says X amount of years, you go, that's <laughs> just going to be, you know, whatever it was, nine years, 15 years, something like that. You're like, why do I even care now? This is going to take for, but now fast forward and, <laughs> and it's all been <laughs> completed. Now yeah. we're like, wow, that was, you know, that happened already. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you're right. In the nineties, it was all about, you know, these genetics and and the fact that they were going to start being able to count things and figure things out and reproduce things and map things out and there were those discussions where we're like what are the implications of this technology right um you know I, if, if i'm not mistaken they they started uh <laughs> you know, the idea of test tube babies or these kinds of, uh, you know, they, they were really playing in the idea of uh, genetically uh, manipulating childbirths and, and whatnot. And so all of this stuff was new ideas. They, you know, uh, being inseminated in, in, in these different ways and having, that wasn't really a normal thing to do at the time, mm. you know? Um, so this was the beginning of it. And I like the way that they get into it. Now they mentioned a word. A word they called it the eugenics war. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, I had to look back up into the eugenics history, and um, you know, a lot of the eugenics eugenics was discredited, especially heavily after the Nazis used it um, in World War II. So there was a uh, a push. A, to use it. And then there was a push against and blowback against it because of how it was used improperly. So uh, very good topics and subject matter, which is why, once again, I think the writers show their level of uh, awareness of, of world events and, and, and current events to, to be able to incorporate it all into these kinds of episodes. I thought it's fantastic. Yeah, uh, and they're, they do discuss it in other Star Trek series as well. Um, Khan Noonien Singh was also, you know, Khan from uh, Star Trek II and from Space Seed in the original series. He was a product of this genetic engineering. I just did a quick search right now to see when it's supposed to take place. And it says the eugenics wars were a series of conflicts fought on Earth between 
1992 and 1996. (laughs) But this was during the original series. This was in the 60s that they predicted this. So so that didn't happen, I don't think. Or maybe they went back in time and fixed it or whatever. But then also there's a lot more that's covered in uh, Enterprise as well. I don't remember too much of the specifics, but I remember there's these these augments, you know, is what they called them and, and things like that. But yeah, so it's it's been covered in a couple other things too. So as soon as they said the eugenics award, my ears perked up. I was like, oh, that's right. What's, but that's it. They didn't mention anything about it beyond that. <laughs> um, yeah. And of course there were other movies that precede uh, this episode. For example, Blade Runner is all yeah. about, you know, hunting down these, these uh, mutants, quote unquote. Right. And mm-hmm. so there was, there was always some kind of, we were headed in the direction of the thought of genetically engineering and modifying people and, and, and cyborgs, you know, Terminator obviously dealt with the cyborg issue. And um, so there was, you know, a lot of interest in that department. So this is just another way to deal with it, but I thought they dealt with it in a more practical way as far as uh, not making it so much about that, but taking that as the baseline of this story and then making it about the Dominion and them being smart enough, these whiz kids that are able to calculate all yeah. these uh, probabilities. So definitely like the way they attack the, uh, this particular issue and this subject matter. Mm-hmm. So uh, we got to jump to our break real quick. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about this and we'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hey everybody, welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton. Yeah, hello, hello. There we go. Uh, this is fun time. Statistical probabilities, Deep Space Nine, season six, episode nine. Uh, let's knock out some trivioids right quick, as the French say. Karen's not that kind of girl. Jack can do a backflip. Patrick likes parties. And Serena did the right thing. Worf believes maybe I should have just done that at the top. That was that was way smoother. <laughs> just those four. And easier, right? Right. There. And that would have been a perfect little uh Worf yeah. believes Bashir is an exception. There's uh the senior staff speculates about what Goldemar will say in his new speech. Karen thinks Demar doesn't sleep. The mutants call Damar the Pretender, Wayun the Dark Knight, Dukat the Dethroned King, and Zial the Princess. Damar and Wayun are on their way to Deep Space Nine. Wayun uses the passive voice transitive. I had to rewind that a couple of times. Um, <laughs> Patrick thinks the Dominion want the Cabral system. Chemistry was never Captain Sisko's strong suit. Fill you there, Captain. Uh, Chief O'Brien makes Patrick cry. <laughs> that was a great scene. We should talk about that too. Yeah, yeah, uh, I love Cisco that. says, even if I knew with 100% certainty what was going to happen, I wouldn't ask an entire generation of people to voluntarily give up their freedom. Uh, I almost went into an impression there. And Bashir loses at the Dabo wheel eventually. All right. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the scene with... Uh, <laughs> O'Brien was so cute when he comes in and he's he's recalibrating something or other. And they're like, and the guy's like, the thing's not even broken. He doesn't like <laughs> us, you know, and he totally he totally calls out uh, O'Brien on that because he just misses yeah. his friend and he was jealous. I love that moment. Uh, I wrote it down here as well. Um, I thought it was really funny the way when he tries to put that little birthday hat on top of him, a little party hat, he's like, no, thanks. And he's really like turned off by it. And he's like, I need to get to work. He's like, just leave me alone. But clearly he's there to get attention and, you know, get his buddy's attention. So I like the way he gets called out on the moment. Um, Mm -hmm. Very natural acting from column always in my opinion, but this is just another example of him uh, being so natural like, I, yes. I really believe when he's irritated. I really believe when he's, uh, <laughs> uh, even when he told Bashir to step back, and you know, when they were throwing darts and he's like, hey, 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 get back there, you know, step, go back to where you're supposed to be throwing from. 
uh, the way he calls him out on that, it's just, it's just feels so natural. So, um, you know, Colm is a, a, an amazing actor and he makes it look so effortless that sometimes you don't even notice that he's actually acting. Right? He's, you feel well, yeah. like you're just watching it. That's the thing. Yeah. Exactly. It, it almost feels like, is he even acting? Is he or is he just naturally crotchety? It seems like, I, I mean, I've never met the guy, so I, I can't speak on this at all. But I mean, is he just naturally kind of kind of grisly, kind of grumpy? Uh, <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. he, he's, he's naturally honest and, and, and speaks, you know, the truth. So he doesn't, you know, pad or, or play with things that he's not really, if he doesn't like something, he'll, you'll know it right away. So mm-hmm. I would say he's very honest and forthright. Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Cause it doesn't seem like, like you say, it's like, it, it's, he's such a natural. It's like, he could just deliver lines naturally. And you're like, Hmm, O'Brien's grumpy, but maybe it's not O'Brien. Maybe it's just <laughs> column. <laughs> that's yeah. It's, it's, it, whatever he does, it looks so effortless. And like I said, I just love the, the moments. He has very subtle looks where he kind of looks at you like this, uh, he did that with Bashir in the, in the dark game. He kind of gave him a couple of looks yeah. here and there. Um, so he's just natural. I, I just, that's basically the best way I can put it. I, it looks so effortless for him. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was the, the scene where the whole crew is eating together and Bashir sitting yes. there explaining. That was like the first time I think I've seen them hang all together in a non-ops moment, right? I, I yes, I absolutely noticed that too. And I yeah. liked, I liked it. I thought it was, it was good to show that camaraderie and and, uh, yeah. you know, them having drinks. I liked that too, and but it also made me think that they're just such a click that even when they're off duty they don't even have like two or three extra friends. Like, it's not like, you know, it's not like Dax has a couple other pals that she also hangs out with or that maybe, maybe Worf and Dax are are hanging out with two other people. And these guys have a different couple. Like there's like no deviation from these are the seven in ops. These are the seven (laughs) that hang out with each other. You would think that there'd be some kind of, I mean, I mean, I definitely like that, though. I mean, you do like to see that camaraderie. I mean, um, Next Generation does that very well when they have their poker games, their poker nights. But even then, they never had all seven of them playing poker at the same time until the very last scene of the very last episode. Before that, it was like usually like four or five of them you know, playing, and then maybe one, one extra person might be in there if the story you know, needs it or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it's nice to see that, you know, and, and, if, and you know that Dax is the one that dragged Worf along. It wasn't like Worf saying like, Jadzia, we must go see our friends. You know, <laughs> no, it, was, it was her dragging that big lug along. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing that they said in that scene was um, you, you gave them access to the comms. Um, so I, you know, part of their camaraderie, I would say, maybe stems for the fact that they uh, have this high level security clearance and that there's a certain amount of things that they can talk freely and openly about amongst each other, you know, that they wouldn't be able to kind of share and have these kind of open conversations outside of that clearance. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I did like, I just liked the moment. I was like, well, all of them here together at the same time. Uh, that must have been a nightmare for the AD on the set, trying to wrangle everybody up for the uh, for that scene. But yeah. I did like it. Yeah. I did like it. That's true. That's a, that's a pretty crazy day when all the leads are in, in a scene together. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, usually they're just a, a chunk of them. Although sometimes they're they're together in like the briefing room or the conference room or whatever. They're kind of, you know, where where you have uh, O'Brien saying, well, what about if we do something, you know, whatever like that? And then, you know, Dax is like, yeah, that might just work. And they come up with a solution together. (laughs) 
Uh, also thought it was very clever the way these mutants were analyzing the footage of the, the Mars oh. negotiation. Very good, very clever. I love the way they were able to read his expressions and say, well, he killed somebody. And they, they basically gave us the backstory of what we'd already known. Um, but, you know, in, in, and filled it up with the dialogue in this episode. I thought it was great, uh, clever writing. Uh, he, he's obviously being forced to say this. You know, they mm-hmm. were they were going through this analyzation of what he was saying. You know, um, he doesn't want to be there. He killed somebody. You know, new to power, and you know all of these things yeah. that we we know. So I, right. I really like that. Now, uh, and that was such a clever, you know, writing, you know, uh, scheme or. Uh, you know, way of doing things because that way, what they do is they need to, you know, up the stakes. How do they up the stakes? Well, they say that these guys make a prediction that things are going to go poorly. Okay. Well, what do we care? We don't know these people. We don't know if they're any good. They could just all be crazy. They're, they're loony. What, what do we care? So what they do is they have this, you know, this writing method or this, you know, mm-hmm. this trick or this tool where they say, well, let's have them predict something that the audience knows, already knows is true. And that validates them as, wow, these guys can figure out things very quickly and, it, and it's, mm-hmm. it's verified. So now we are along for the ride. It, it has been verified. So now when they make their next prediction, it holds weight because we know these guys know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. And I thought that uh, the old guy, Patrick, had an excellent way of delivering things. They all did, um, except for Serena. She didn't say anything, but, <laughs> but I'm sure she would have had she had any lines. But Patrick, the, you know, when he's like, he's not looking at it. He's not, you know, like he's like excited. And he delivers yeah. it in a way, not in that he knows the answer and he's telling them. He's delivering it in a way of, he just realized something himself. He's just, I just realized something, you know, and that's a, obviously a, a, yeah. a more true to the character way of delivering, uh, delivering things. And, and you're right. I think that just made it that much more interesting. It was good. It made it that much more interesting. And speaking of Patrick, I did like the childlike way he approached everything. He had this kind of innocence about him. Uh, even when he started, it was offended by O'Brien not wanting to put the hat on. He had this kind of childlike innocence <laughs> yes. when he started to cry. He doesn't like me. You know, that's it's really it was really nice. Um, the other thing that I thought was brilliant was the the explanation for their uh, uh, what they eventually calculated as far as the Cabrel system, the Mizanite deposits and the Ketracel white. Totally. Um, that was like golden for me. I was like, wow, these guys another thing that the writers used um, to kind of validate, you know, their intelligence and their ability to calculate, you know, where, what was going on. So I did like that entire um, introduction for that um, idea, the Ketracel white, the supply of it, what it meant to the, the Jemadar and um, how they were in seek in search of it. So I, I really liked that moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also the, the, the oh oh sorry I was going to bring up the uh, the waltz the dance very nice no you very go right beautiful. ahead yeah yeah I was just going to agree with you <laughs> <laughs> no, I like the moment of the dance that's all um, that was another moment that I thought was just very uh, they said you know they went went to the orchestra music and they had the nice little waltz in there a nice special touch for me as well yeah I I like that because it's it's okay to have kind of silly or cheesy or lighthearted scenes we actually enjoy them when they're after heavy episodes or heavy scenes you know you got to give the audience a break you got to give them Mm -hmm. an earned reprieve you know you can't just be tense the whole way it needs to lighten up give them a win make make things happy make things silly and this was kind of a silly episode this this had a very strong mixture of of silly and childish with heavy and dark. And uh, what did O'Brien call it? Grim. He said, that's grim. Uh, now, yeah. <laughs> Patrick here. So the one dude, Jack had the, had the mm-hmm thing and Patrick, what he did, I noticed 
was he held his hands just like right here under his belly. Like he just kind of held them here. That was kind of his style. And that's how he walked around. And, and then the only time he wasn't doing that was when he was doing something with his hands, you know, when he's holding a cup or when he's dancing or when he's reaching, running for a hug, he just runs at the doctor for a hug, you know, comes <laughs> at her. and I was like, wow, this guy leads with his hands. And I, I rewound that to watch it again. I was like, that was a smart, smart move there. You know, uh, I I've never seen the actor before. I don't, I feel like the lady, uh, Karen, the sultry one. I feel like she's been in other stuff too. I haven't checked, but she's the one that I think may be recognizable to me. Yeah, she was, uh, clearly we know what she was enhanced with. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, she even sexual. asked him, she's like, oh, what were you enhanced <laughs> yeah. with? He's like, just mental, honey, slow yeah. it down. Relax. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also like the, the moment where he says, here it comes, the we can still contribute speech. I love that line right there. It was some really good lines in this episode, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, hats off to Renee Echeverria. Um, or Echeverria. Mm-hmm. Very good lines in this. Um, you know, uh, C- Cisco, I thought, just just made this even better than it already kind of was it was okay but then cisco to me really just delivered some performances there that i thought were just top notch right and uh, that i personally it, was not expecting i didn't think i thought it was going to be a bashir episode this or that but they they gave avery some really important pieces small pieces of this episode but of course he knew how powerful those moments were and he delivered them as such. Yeah. And I, I found myself writing down some of the stuff and you led with this in, in your opening. Right. Um, but I just found myself surrender to the dominion, not on my watch, you know, yeah. Cisco was, yeah, that was just like powerful stuff. And then of course, Bashir's like, don't you think that's your ego talking? And, you know, <laughs> And he just doubles down and goes even harder on, uh, you know, surrender is not an option. I don't care if the odds are against us. If we're going to lose, then we're going to go down fighting. Yes. And that, to me, basically sums Cisco up in the entire this. That that's him in a nutshell. Game. Yeah, totally. That's him in a nutshell. That's Cisco. And he doesn't. He might. He doesn't accept the idea that you know, defeat is, is around the corner. It's like, if I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose going down fighting. And I thought that's, and then he mentions why he said that way for generations to come, people know who they came from. They came from a group of fighters Mm -hmm. who resisted this. So you're going to have to continue the fight. So he's thinking long-term, even when he makes that speech, you know, Mm -hmm. generationally, uh, this is who we are. We're the, we're the group that stands against, you know, tyranny we're the group totally. that fights for justice and truth i thought that was classic and it, it seems like that's what he's always stood for yeah like you're saying like it, that is a common theme among the cisco storyline for six seasons same thing with major kira same thing with deep space nine as a whole the show is about that that is a theme along the show is just no matter the odds fight and stand up and, you know, just don't let go. And I do think that uh, another really good line that Cisco said, and I did write this one down, is uh, he said, I might need your help on how to win this war, but I don't need your help on how to lose it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's so funny because it, it's yeah. because you get caught up in it too. You're like, well, yeah. the guys are always right. They know what they're doing. We need to save a bunch of lives. I get it. I'm with you. I'm 100% with you. And it takes Cisco to give us a different perspective. And then O'Brien as well, give us a different perspective for us to kind of snap ourselves out and be out of it and say, Oh yeah, what was I thinking? Like it, it's not written in stone and, and we don't, we don't need advice on how to, you know, what's the better way to lose a war. No, we just, you keep focusing on figuring out a way to win, not what's the best way to lose. Great, great stuff. Absolutely. It was great stuff. And I, I and, and even the, the scene where uh, O'Brien 
tells Bashir, he's like, maybe I'm just too stupid to, you know. Oh, that was good. To agree scene. with. Oh, it was just, it was classic. He, he does one of those drop the mic moments and walks out of the shot, you know. And I just thought that's a great moment because he's basically saying, you know, you're running around here thinking you're smarter than everybody. And I guess I'm just a dummy who thinks that we shouldn't surrender and you know give up. Mm -hmm. And I love the way that they, they articulate that in this episode. And I think Cisco really does kind of sum up who he is and what the show is about. Um, totally. You know, as far as going down fighting and even so much so, as I would say, it reflects, it, it also reflects the writer's position. I, I feel like hmm. in some ways, um, you know, Ira said we were under the radar and, you know, the, the, the executives and the suits weren't really watching over us, which gave us carte blanche to kind of just just go and, and do what we wanted to do. And if we're going to go down, we're going to go down fighting our own way, our own style. We're going to write the exactly. show that we want to write. And, you know, if, if we get canceled, we get canceled or whatever is going to happen is going to happen. But we're not going to surrender before we put up the fight. And I thought I think that's indicative of the show itself. You know what Deep Space Nine is about. Totally agree. Yeah, it was like that that line almost encapsulated not just who Cisco is, but kind of the heart of the show and the heart of the people making the show. Um, yeah. I don't know if they felt that strongly about that line when they did it, but sometimes how a writer honestly feels or their, their outlook on life for their own lives has a way of sneaking onto the page. You know, sometimes uh -huh. it's deliberate. Sometimes it's just how they view the world. You know, like if, if somebody, if they're writing somebody giving another person a piece of advice, Sometimes that advice is the advice that they give as a person to somebody else. You know what I mean? Or it's sometimes it's the advice they wish somebody had given them. Uh, but yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that. And, and, and that's the other thing that I think is so clever about DS9's writing um, is the way they give the advice because we see people giving advice on other shows now on the new Star Trek shows. And there's a, uh, you know, they, they go into this whole kind of psychiatrist way of saying stuff, right? Well, you need to challenge your emotions and take care of this. And, and they do this whole, like, you know, um, it, it is, it is wiser to, to say nothing. You know, they, they go through these. Yeah. Well, yeah. Philosophizing in these kinds of, uh, psychiatrist statements when they're going, you know, through these speeches. But what DS9 does is give you a more real um, interaction and conversation that would happen between two people. And for example, Quark and Bashir. When yeah. Quark's Bashir's at the bar and he's like, "Hey, this is we're all going to lose. It's all rigged. You know, it's rigged against us. What's the point of even playing? You're going to lose." And Quark, <laughs> instead of saying, you know, in life. One loses and one wins. And, <laughs> you know, and they, <laughs> and they hug. <laughs> and they hug. And, you know, instead of saying it like that, they have a better way of saying it. And Quark's like, hey, keep it down. You know, you're trying, people are trying to have fun over here. <laughs> like, right. The way Deep Space Nine uh, delivers things is two people that on the surface are at odds with each other. Uh, but then there's like an underlying understanding or respect between them. It's not O'Brien and Quark, you know, saying how much they love each other. They're saying how much they hate each other. But there's a little bit of respect there. Even when, even between best friends, Bashir and O'Brien, they're not talking yeah. like, like what people would automatically think are best friends, but it's much more realistic because they're like, if you if you actually recorded how best friends talk to each other, they do. They talk shit to each other. They razz yeah. each other. They don't come up and be like, "Hey, I love you. I miss you." All that you know. Sometimes maybe, but for the most part, we're sitting here being like, "Oh my god, you're so freaking ugly, right?" Oh yeah, I'm ugly. Look at that hat. Or, you know what I mean? Like, but that's because <laughs> yeah. that's where the real respect comes from when we get it. And Deep Space Nine does that really well. It looks real. It feels real. And the audience is smart enough to get it, to see what the feeling is under there. Absolutely. And that's what I feel is great about the show. The open and honest conversations there, they, they have these moments like, you know, 
like I mentioned earlier, where O'Brien tells Bashir, like, well, you know, I'm not a genius like you are, yeah. you know, but <laughs> but this is how I see it. I see it like this and I'm not I'm not willing to see it your way and kind of does a walk off moment. So those are those to me are like real life conversations. It feels authentic. It's not like, well, when one feels like they must. <laughs> They should. You know, it's like, the second you use the word says, one in there, the, this yeah, conversation's over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who says stuff like that? When one feels sad, they must always look to the stars and find the better. You know, it's yeah. like, come on, man. Just just, just say what you feel. Or if you don't like it, you don't like it. If, be honest about the dialogue. And, and to me, uh, what they do a very good job on DS9 is capturing dialogue that seems authentic, that seems like it is the way. Absolutely. And I feel like, I feel like, you know, think, thanks to the uh, Deep Space Nine documentary, what we left behind, when Ira gave us a glimpse into the writer's room, yeah. there, was, there was that kind of level of uh, banter between the writers. They didn't say, oh, you're so right, Ira. How, how smart of you to give us, you know, <laughs> they would just say, I don't like that. I don't think that's, that's not yeah. the way it works. I, he would do it like this. Wouldn't he be like that? No, no. Do it with know. the wiffle ball bat. So, uh, yeah. So the, the, the honesty between them is, is seems to me also a reflection of the honesty that the writers had between each other. They were not totally. scared to tell each other that's a bad idea or I would go in a different direction or, you know, so the, the brutal honesty is always, I, for, for me, it seems like a reflection of how, what was going on in the writer's room. Mm -hmm. which was the tone that Ira was setting for, you know, for, for everybody in there. Let's talk more about this in a moment. we got to go to the free for all, uh, by the way, the wiffle bat line was from the beastie boys. I didn't just like go off into nowhere. Most people, <laughs> most people are like, did he just say wiffle ball bat? Where, what conversation did he think we were having here? But it's some people anyway. Uh, special thanks to Carmen Shamwell, AKA skillet, TJ Jackson skillet. Bay out in Missouri. Yvette Blackman, Homer Freezy out somewhere in New Yeezy, Eve England out in Wales, Bill Victor Arukin. Uh, Arukin. <laughs> Doc, Dr. Anne Marie Siegel, Titus Muller, Tim Baum, John Mann, Darlena Marie, Rex A. Wood, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Joe Balserati, Tierney C. Diekman, and of course, above the sky. Dr. Susan V. Gruner. I don't know why I said above the sky. I just felt like really <laughs> hammering that one home. Special thanks to her. Stick around. Here comes the free for all. Until then, always remember the seventh rule. Hey everybody, welcome back to the seventh rule. This is the free for all. It's party time. It's a uh, boy. Eve is festive. Melissa's festive. The rest of us are just a bunch of nerds. But uh, we've got Dr. Sue Gruner here. Yay. Yay. We've got <laughs> Tierney C. Diekman. We have uh, Melissa Longo wearing two hats on two fingers. It's Is that going to be available at your store, walkingartmadebymelissa.com, or is that a one-time thing? Oh, it was a one-time thing, but I could <laughs> probably could be. Don't put that pressure on her. Come on. Second Christmas. So if you like it, <laughs> let her know. Uh, we have Homer Freezy out somewhere in New Yeezy wearing the first contact slash Deep Space Nine uniform that looks awesome. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Eve England is wearing a chat pack shirt and Christmas lights. Heck yeah. <laughs> Looking That's awesome. Goldie Scott. I think earrings. I don't oh, wait. The earrings. Let's see the earrings. Yes. Oh my nice. god, a little defiant. defiant. I just saw those oh. online like a day ago. I love so them. So awesome. Cloaked <laughs> defiant. Of course she's already got them. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, Goldu Scott is wearing an Abyssinian kiosk version of the Cisco Kid shirt. Check that out in the description box below yeah. as well. I'm wearing something too. It's all wet because I was just washing my car. I wasn't Let's going to it. be here because I, I look like a wet rat. I was literally <laughs> washed my car. Let's see the, what and... it is. Oh, yes. There yes. It is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> worth the wait. Definitely worth the yes. wait. Uh, everybody listening in, it's a, a seventh rule shirt from our Teespring store. You can find that in the description box below as well. It's 
Jake Cisco's head looking all sultry. It's really cool. <laughs> all good. right. His mind. Let's talk yeah. about this episode. Sorak and I, we did not run out of things to talk about with this episode, did we? We still, first of all, I counted three NAMs. Do you guys get the NAMs? Non-appearance mentions for everybody listening at home. Three non-appearance mentions. Ducat uh -huh. was one. Zial. Mm -hmm. R.I.P. Uh, they said something about, <laughs> about O'Brien being married. Does that count? Yeah, someone said, yeah, <laughs> Pico. Yeah, he said my wife. He said your yeah. wife. Somebody said your wife. So that's all it takes. No. Yeah. The other counts to be. <laughs> Homer doesn't say. But what, then count. Bashir oh, also said, told Lauren that he's married too. So it was done twice. Yeah. He was inferred he was married, but I don't, I don't know if that's a name. Yeah. Somebody said his wife isn't here or your wife's not here when he was like lonely for Bashir. Oh yeah, that's oh, right. was Lauren. Yeah, yeah. Yep. You want to go play with your friend? Go to the holiday, <laughs> and they scamper off all happy. Oh, and we also didn't have. We missed everything because we we're too busy talking about good stuff. Jake Cisco guesses the IMDb score. Uh, definitely higher than the last episode. That's for sure. <laughs> um, Bold prediction. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to say about a 7.5. I'm going to go around there. Does anybody else have a guess that didn't already see it? Eve's like, I checked. <laughs> it's not a 10. It's not a 10. <laughs> it's not a 10. No. Showing off your skills again. 7.6. Oh, oh no. close. I'm wow. close. Pretty wow. Close. Yeah. On fire. And uh, that's higher than most people here would have given it, I think. When the consensus we were taking, a lot yeah. of people were saying naughty things about this episode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do tell, do tell. When did that happen? You know, <laughs> who was it? Was it Sue? Was it you that were saying that this one wasn't? I feel like it was. It's definitely not one of my faves, but I was reading the, I have it here, the IMDB thing, easily one of the worst episodes of the entire series. That's just the beginning of the review. Oh, no. <laughs> wow. That's the title. Wow. <laughs> I love it when people rage rate. They're like, one, <laughs> it's the worst thing. No, it's not that bad. Calm down. It's not. People love raging, though. They, they refuse to find positive things in, mm -hmm. in anything. But we don't. Uh, Homer, do you have any positive thoughts to share about this episode today? Yeah, I actually enjoyed it more than I thought I would upon the rewatch. So did um, I. I, I thought that uh, Jack was a little over the top and a bit too much. You know, I mean, I know what they're going for. And I would have liked a little bit more from Lauren and from the, the party guy behind you there. <laughs> but, <guy>. uh, <laughs> it, it was, it was a lot of fun. It actually brought up some issues as well about yeah. how people who are different or are feared are treated. So I, I like that aspect of it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. We didn't touch they on never that. They changed their yeah. clothes. They're wearing the same outfits the whole damn time. Was this supposed to be that's, over a day or um, a that's, that's a few weeks? That's yeah, that's the nitpicks. Uh, that's the nitpick thing. There, so that's a solid that nitpick, later. though. Yeah, it's solid. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe they have like the the men in black wardrobe. So they have, just that's have the same get. thing over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, they just open their closet and it's just all the same yeah. thing. Melissa, yeah. what are your thoughts on this episode? And why you said it was a top four episode of Deep Space Nine ever? <laughs> you said. Oh yes, I loved it that much. <laughs> no, um, I I was also pleasantly surprised because this was never one of my favorites. Um, it's still not wonderful, but it, it's uh, it asks some interesting questions, um, especially. 
like what Homer was alluding to, the, the um, way we look at different people, people who are different than us, who have different social skills than we do, um, who are different than quote unquote normal. Um, and what does that even mean? But uh, it also lo looks at the question is, you know, just because you're a genius doesn't mean you have the, all the answers either, because you're, you're looking at all these statistics and, and predicting the future and all this stuff with statistics, but you're not looking at uh, free will, you know, the choice. People, each individual has a choice. And Bashir was right when he said one person can change that yeah. because she did. She did change the outcome of what that was. So um, it, it was a humbling moment for Bashir too, I think, a learning moment for him, which, which I always like seeing learning moments. So, yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you feel like, because I felt this way, did, did you feel like we were kind of taught a lesson a little bit? When I was watching it, I had to also be reminded at the same time as Bashir of like, just because these geniuses are predicting something doesn't, doesn't make it like fact, you know, who knows, anything can still happen. So I feel like when they were telling that to Bashir, they're also telling it to the viewer where we're like, oh yeah, that's right. What am I going along with these weirdos? We can, we don't have to lose 900 billion people, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I was, I was rallying behind Cisco in the fact that you're, you're, you can't ask yeah, they might have saved 900 billion lives, but you can't ask those 900 billion lives that you saved to give up their lives to be enslaved by the dominion. So then what's the point of living if if that's the only other choice? So, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, got, I got pretty irritated by, by the presumption, presumptiveness of, of that choice. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. We, we covered that a bit, Rock, right? I mean, it's, it's great stuff with Cisco. I mean, he only had like a couple scenes, but they were very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When, when you were just saying that, Melissa, that reminded me of a Ronald Reagan speech that is floating around on the Internet. And in the speech, he says something to the effect of, um, there's only one way to ensure peace. And that is like through like surrender or something we could surrender. Um, but if we surrender, then, you know, we're, we're basically enslaving the generations of our, uh, our ancestors. So he says in that speech, surrender is not an option. So when I heard Cisco said it, I was like, Oh, wow, that's, 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 uh, that's a Ronald Reagan ish kind of, uh, quote you know if we're going to lose then we have to go down fighting mm. you know he mentions going down fighting and so um i i do think that that's an an issue that you know you know when when world war ii was happening we could have surrendered to the the germans and just said oh well they're gonna win and let's let's you know it's over um but then you know, what life would we, would we be living right now? So I think um, fighting, as Cisco pointed out, is something that we do to show future generations uh, who we are and what we will not tolerate and what we will not accept, right? We won't accept giving up our freedom for simply surviving because surviving without freedom is... Is just, is just as bad as dying. <laughs> exactly. Somebody knows yeah. the quote, something about, I'd rather live, you know, die on my feet than live on my knees. Live on my, knees, on my yeah. knees. Yeah. I don't remember. I think that's got to be one of mm. Thomas Jefferson or one of those people from before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> All of us, actually. Yeah, <laughs> time before ago. I was born. <laughs> Back in the 40s or something. Yeah, way, way back. In the way back. Way back. The way back. Sorry, machine. Homer. We can't all be smart. Way back before the interweb. <laughs> uh, Sue, do you have any fun thoughts on this episode? No. 
<laughs> Very clear. So I, 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 I get everything that you're saying, and I agree there was a certain uncomfortableness about this, about the way people that have that are different are treated. But I'm, I guess I'm just looking at it at a different perspective. It's the same thing, but different, if that makes any sense at all. Why were they kept in a, yeah. Yeah. what what yeah. room was that in? Cargo Why were bay. they all together? Oh, Why were they yeah, it's a cargo bay. bay. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's bizarre. With padded walls. <laughs> yeah. That's it. <laughs> Yeah. You know, why not give them their own rooms? At, and the, just the whole thing to me seemed unreal, unrealistic. Do you think uh, not? Because I thought about this too. Like, why? Like, is that kind of inhumane? They're like, oh, we've got four guests coming. Let's put them all in the same freaking yeah. room, not the same quarters, the different room. rooms, but one room. I'm like, are they just treating them like second class citizens? But then in my own head, canon, as the French say, I thought, Maybe the doctor told them, hey, they need to sleep in the same place. They don't like to be apart. They're they're attached to each other. Maybe it's it's something like that to where they said, Oh, we'll get four quarters. And they said, like, oh no, no, no. They they freak out if they get, you know, separated. What do but you think? Then there was a- only one cot. No, there were a bunch of beds, weren't there? There were beds off like to the side. Around them. Oh, around. okay. Yeah. The beds are more that noticeable in their next episode. <laughs> in Chrysalis, when they come back, they're noticeable. The beds. Yeah. They, do actually, <laughs> they do actually talk about that in the campaign, actually. They say oh. that they originally wanted to have all of their scenes shot in the wardroom, but for logistically, they just couldn't. There were just too many of them, and they couldn't sort of get it to work out in the smaller quarter. So then they thought, okay, let's try the cargo bay. And so that actually what they they felt that then that made a statement as to, okay, well, is this the way that Starfleet treats these people who are slightly different or who they don't quite see as regular members of society? So they 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 thought that was quite a good way of bringing all of that together in terms of that question as as to how Starfleet treat these people. Mm. Um, so yeah, so it was. I think it was something that was done because of a practical reason, but then they try to work that into the the way that they did it. And I think that sort of worked then with, you know, that bit when Bashir is talking in the party about, you know, where you need to be able to integrate and give these guys a chance to do regular activities because, they you know, they're just going stir crazy when they're just locked up. And, you know, and that discussion about, well, you know, then that puts everyone at a disadvantage and this is going to make people want to uh, enhance their kids. And and I, I thought that, that was quite an interesting point then in terms of okay yeah. well how would these guys be actually if they were in the real world you know maybe they're just even more sort of different because they're in this completely unnatural and inhumane you know place that they're, they're forced to live in mm-hmm. so it sounds like the in-universe explanation to the logistical situation is closer to what sue was actually saying which was they're just not treating them well mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. exactly they're just not as evolved in some areas as they'd like us to believe and they still have some work to do right so yeah and i don't see that they're uh a danger to society or anything i did i'm jack. missing something i guess jack. I, I don't yes, get it. Yeah. jack has no problem assaulting people and that was oh, <laughs> to break their neck yeah, yeah. <laughs> i yeah i i actually put it in my notes i had notes about this which i was surprised uh going back watching it uh found a lot more to like about it and a lot mm-hmm. deeper or perceived deeper meaning um, than I had initially connected with it. That at one point, Jack, uh, he puts uh, his rules of chewing with your mouth closed, uh, societal rules of chewing with your mouth closed, as well as, you know, don't open an airlock when there's someone inside of it on the same equal plane of Mm -hmm. morality uh and uh among other things and like what uh what melissa was saying with the uh well just just with the the fighting of um well trying to think of how to fully phrase this well it's the i'm stepping all over my own words and thoughts here Taking notes is a bad idea. Get everything confused. The um, 
the way that they make the calculations for what's going to happen. Do we mm -hmm. save, you know, 900 billion lives? Do we choose to surrender? Uh, of course, we don't want to surrender. I mean, this is the Federation, for God's sake, and this is the Dominion. And we want to fight. What's the point of living as captives to to this as opposed to just dying? It, it's, anyway, uh, one of my favorite things about this episode is uh, that it's based around Asimov's foundation, which I'm the stupid, huge Asimov fan. So that part of the episode was that didn't resonate with me as much because it just sort of followed along Asimov's psychohistory and viewing everything as a whole throughout time. The variables are bigger, the rise and fall of the empire and unable to see the minutia and the individual variables of people that a single individual can change the course of history. It's that's all it is in this case it was Serena um that's that was understandable but it was the treatment of them as just as people that hit hard they had they did a really nice job at least in my opinion of equaling out their supposed to be genetically engineered as well as kind of to me at least putting um a good nail in how people with mental health issues with, uh, with even some physical health issues are treated back then and still now, uh, whether it is something natural in this case, it's unnatural. There was no informed consent. They were children. Uh, Bashir had the same issue. He just, turned out okay lots of people don't just as if they're abused and they grow up unstable and it's not their fault but they are still treated as if they are mm -hmm. incompetent um if they're they're, they're well, unpredictable which if you're perceived as unpredictable it's much more it's people perceive you as immoral more often if they can't see what your actions might be if they can't predict them. Uh, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, that you have to keep proving yourself beyond that and very publicly that your instability, your everything that makes you separated, makes you worthy. And these people don't get the chance, just like many in institutions, many with mental health issues that don't quite fit the mold. And they're treated, many of any of us possibly are treated like crap. And it's not even our fault. I mean, they were, I had that in my notes too. They were beamed into a cargo bay unseen. I mean, have you seen some of the quarters for the senior staff? They're friggin' huge. Like they couldn't put four beds in a cot in one of those. I understand if there's not any quarters, but that is terrible. We have Worf's prejudice towards it saying they should be excluded from everything, but Julian's an exception just because he can pretend yes. to be okay. Yep. He's a pass. It's that's, so that's what really struck me more so was that it's still very relevant and possibly even relevant to many of us in this group if we've ever had issues with severe depression, anxiety, bipolar, anything that you have that feeling of being isolated or have had to deal with it on a deeper level medically, it's hell to try to talk to anybody else about it that doesn't understand it. You will be excluded and treated as less no matter how intelligent you are such as these people that the original plan is they were supposed to be consultants for a starfleet and they were seen as too neurotic as characters that they couldn't do this so instead they were institutionalized um, and just happened to help starfleet as it went on so i'm sorry i'm talking way too much for everybody else but uh so that that at least is what 
hit me with it that I think might be even why I didn't pay as much attention to the episode the 10, 20 times I've watched through the series before is it might hit a little too close to home as far Mm -hmm. as mental health issues and advocacy is it hurts. It hurts Mm -hmm. to see this in something so beloved, but I mean, Anyway, I've said my piece except for one note in the beginning. What the hell is Serena doing at the door when they're first in the cargo bay and she's crawling at it like a cat? What is she doing? I, see, I was and waiting I, for her to have a line. Never hear. Like one she was line. Supposed there, to. But she was she, supposed yeah. to when she untied Bashir and they uh, they cut it. Hmm. She's supposed to basically be that. catatonic. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. yeah, no, it's definitely an episode that I, I thought was better this on this view than what I had remembered. Um, and Deep Space Nine does keep doing that to us where episodes seem to be getting better with time and more relevant with time. Uh, Goldu Scott. Yes. You're going to be Gold <laughs> Dumar soon. Gold du- no, that, doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work, does Figure it? Who can do that? Uh, any Dumar. thoughts on this episode? Oh, man, I had a couple of them. Uh, mostly was that senior talking about when Bashir comes in and presents everything to cisco and it's you know the whole combat back and forth how light that scene begins and how funny it is and how kind of sad it is that julian here we are how long have we been watching him has finally found people he feels like he actually really belongs with with this group of of people over here that and he's presenting all these pads and he's throwing these pads and i I laugh to myself because um, all these pads yeah, because when I, I last year I was working in a, in a place of business that was not nerdy. You know, I've worked in comic shops and record stores and in a game store now. So, um, and there's always that one person that everybody comes to that gets super popular when a Marvel movie comes out, and they're like, "Oh man, what do you what do you think about what?" And that's what Julian had this bounce the whole time until Cisco unfortunately had to just you know, what is this crap? What are you telling me? You just run, run it down. <laughs> But then Cisco's reaction right there, like I, I, I swear, I don't know why that that line that that's Rock was talking about, that speech that he gave, why that's not quoted more in DS9 fandom, because that right Which there line? is the when he says, "I would rather you know yeah. going down swinging." We're gonna yeah. if this kills us, it kills us, but we're going down swinging, and that line right there, that whole just his entire just being in that moment is exactly what would make me follow him completely to hell and back, or or just follow him to hell if we knew we weren't coming back because man that dude <laughs> ooh. and the, the fun part is, is that all these statistical you know in probably the the whole foundation thing that was hitting me too tyranny that's absolutely awesome the whole uh the figuring out war by math and then all the yeah. stuff <laughs> war game. that we having us who have watched this so many times and see a couple of the things that are coming up in the next few episodes that do change you know it's an improbability that certain people act a certain way mm-hmm. and do certain things that we never thought they were going to do and that you know not mm-hmm. only saves nine million lives but in and, and on and on uh no spoilers i'm trying to keep away from all that but <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's funny how people do make a difference and yeah the whole uh well like you guys were talking about with that cargo bay man at least the x-men have a mansion <laughs> yeah they did use the word mutants which made us think of x-men right when they said oh, mutants yeah that's yeah. right. And he's they, they a saying, mutant. Anything that can make me think about the old X-Men, man, that makes me happy. But yeah, there are every single one of them. And by the way, like I, I haven't watched this episode probably in a couple of years or so, but Lauren was absolutely amazing. She was like so magnificent over the top. And just every time she has herself like a cat, like attacking oh, every time somebody comes in. Karen. Yeah, I think her name's Karen, right? Was it Lauren or Karen? The, the lady that's no, Lauren. Down Lauren. Lauren is the character's name. Laura, Hillary yeah. is the actress's name. She played the Benzite in the ship. What is the ship? Right. Ship, correct. Hoya. 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 Yeah. 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 Completely, totally different character. Like you never would have thought if you hadn't looked it up. You That's the I voice. I when I saw that she had played Lieutenant Hoya, you recognize the voice. But um, sorry to interrupt. She Pardon. apparently they had said um, or she had said she wanted it to be very uh boom for her for her character yeah. as Lauren but with just a touch of Hannibal Lecter. Hmm. I mean, I could see, I could see she, she had like a little, a little sadism. edge. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. Like... Unleashed of Lauren could be potentially very possibly a little black widowy. 
Mm. Um, in the conventional sense, not the superhero sense. <laughs> well, maybe even in, that's in the murdery hard. sense. I would no. always talk about clothes and costumes and things like that, but her in red. That's yeah. perfect for her. All in Jack, red. Jack and I also noticed the black. colors for the others mm. that were just were spot on for that. But I, I right. still think they missed something here. I think they had an opportunity to do more with what do you do with people like that in yeah. society? And they just, they just, it was a major surprising miss. Do you well, think, I, 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 oh, okay. sorry. Go no, ahead. no, please. I was just That's gonna it. say, oh, do you was, think that maybe they, they missed that because they were trying to make it relevant to the Dominion War rather than keep it a bottle episode to where maybe yeah they could have yeah. taken it in that angle. Uh, but maybe that's what it is. What were you saying, Melissa? Sorry. Well, I I think it it's a difficult subject to to mm. tackle because there is so much gray. Um, the as far as everyone else's safety is involved as well as the individual's safety, because I personally would not feel safe with Jack being out in society. But, you know, Patrick might be a little bit easier to adjust to being with people, but Jack certainly couldn't. I mean, especially if he's threatening to kill one of his people that he's so close to. So, it, it, it's uh, there's so much gray in that and it, it's kind of the same thing that you alluded to when a tyranny when um you said he he equated one minor thing with something much larger so he couldn't see the variance in the two so subjects so and you know i've met people like that and they're they're kind of dangerous so mm. you know but on the flip side, you can't treat all four of these people like Jack. Right. You know, right. so so how do you how do you juggle that? I mean, it, it, it's yeah. not a, a simple answer as, you know, we can't, you know, I don't totally. know. I mean, there's a well, lot. On, on that note, we do have to uh, run, but. Now you guys know why we had so much to cover mm. when we got to the free call. There like, is a lot to cover. About half more the more. Stuff, Cause there's so much to, there's actually more than I would have personally expected. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff we didn't end up covering that I wanted to cover. Uh, like chief O'Brien, when he walks in and Jack yells at him and he gives Bashir a look like, who the f- is this guy? You What's know, he <laughs> never really had a look there. <laughs> <It's not good. laughs> anyway, we do have to run. But uh, everybody at home, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sue, Tierney, Melissa, Homer, Eve, Goldu Scott, uh, Sirak and I thank you. And we also thank the greatest human in the history of humans, Aaron Eisenberg. And we'll see you all next time. Always remember the seventh rule. I don't know why I looked at you, Melissa, when I said that, just because I think you were going to laugh. <laughs>